Good morning. We are going to do something today that we haven't done for a while. Um, several years ago, we started um, a period in church where we would uh, give testimonies. How we got where God has brought us to, where he's taken us from, and how he got us here. And, and we, we kind of went through the majority of the church, and, and uh, we're going to start that up again. Because it's always encouraging to me to hear other people's testimony, what God has done for them. I see what God does in my life. I, I see what he does in my wife, uh, in our family, in our lives. And, and I get to hear sometimes a bit about what he's doing in yours. But, but to sit down and have somebody actually share what God has done, where he's taken them from and, and brought them to, uh, I think that does nothing but bring glory and honor to God. So this morning... Uh, I have asked Ruth if she would stand up and share her testimony with us. So, ready? Yeah. <laughs> well, time's here, so. All right. Well, Joshua 1 9 says, Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So, I actually just want to open up in prayer. If you guys are okay with that. God, I just ask that you will speak through me today, and that you will be my strength, and that you will be just this this uh this strength inside of me that helps me not be afraid right now i trust in you jesus amen, amen. all right so <clears throat> i'm a little sick sorry when i was well okay so the first time i ever tried smoking a cigarette or doing drugs was when i was eight years old and um so that just kind of goes to show the kind of life that i lived but Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And James 2.10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So all of us are sinners. And we fail every single day. Over the past, like, seven years, people everywhere, it doesn't matter who, when, or where, they always give me the same verse, which is Jeremiah 29.11 which a lot of us know. Um, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. So my whole life, I feel like God has really been trying to teach me about faith and how to have faith in Him. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So that's what faith is. And right below it, Hebrews 11.3 says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And that verse just really clearly represents what God has been trying to do in my life for the past few years. Just taking something completely invisible where I see no direction and just completely blessing me. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys about three times when God has... A, <coughs> I'm going to talk to you guys about three times where God has asked me to step out in faith and how he was glorified just by my obedience to just walk. Um, first time, he asked me to move to Montana. I was living in California at the time, and I really, really did not want to move back. I'm like crying out to him, God, I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back. And all I heard him say was, it's not about what you want. It's about what's best for you. And so, of course, I stopped fighting with the creator, and I decided to move back. And ever since I moved back, he helped me just really connect with my family. I lost my connection through all my past, and he helped me reconnect with my family. And he just like helped me help them out and just reach out to my friends that are still living in sin. And that's an amazing thing. He was glorified through my obedience to just listen and obey him. And then at the beginning of this year in March, at the end of March, um, he told me I was going to be getting married this year. And I was like, oh, that's great. You know, it's fun. And I told my family, they're like, who are you dating? And I'm like, nobody. They're like, well, that's funny. You know, <laughs> good luck with that one. <laughs> and uh, two weeks later, me and Brian started dating. And I told Brian that the Lord had told me I was going to be getting married this year. And so we really felt like God wanted us to get married. And we're like, okay, God. You gave Ruth a word, and you said that she was getting married this year. If so, then God, you need a supply, because we have absolutely nothing. A week later, he gave Brian a vehicle. He gave Brian a job. 
and all of a sudden there's just a ton of money we had so much time and all the resources were just there and like all these people just everyone dropped everything last minute to help us out which was amazing so god was also glorified then because no matter how crazy i sounded i trusted him and i spoke boldly of what or of how his hand was working in my life and that was awesome and then just recently the most recent thing that really was a big thing for me was he asked me to quit my job and I'm like, God, I'm an adult. I need to have my job. This is my identity. I have to work and I'm not going to quit my job just because you say no. And I was just crying and just on my knees. I'm like, I'm not quitting my job. And he's like, because it's my favorite job that I've ever had. And it was just the best. Um, and all I heard him say was, are my hands not big enough to hold you? Mm. And, um, Ever since I quit my job, God has supplied all of our needs, every want that we had. Our storehouse is literally overflowing. It's just like bursting. It's just been, it's just been amazing. So God is glorified because, again, I chose to listen to him no matter how insane everything sounded to me. I'm like, God, I don't see the end result. I don't trust this. And he's like, come on. I'm the creator of the earth. Just walk in my hands. And so as I choose to walk in faith, the Lord just continually blesses me. And I know his hands are big enough to hold me. So I just have a question for you guys. What are you battling with right now? How is the Lord or the Holy Spirit asking you to step out in faith? Do you believe that his hands are big enough to hold you? Remember that Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. He doesn't need you to know how it's going to happen or see the end result. He just needs you to step out in faith. Thank you. Three verses later in Hebrews 11, 6, God says um, that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And I'm, I'm coming to be absolutely convinced. I've kind of had an intellectual knowledge, but I'm, I'm getting a heart knowledge that God expects us to trust him. I, I love her expression that, you know, is his hand not big enough to hold? And I love that God is big enough to hold us. I, I think about uh, God calling to Moses and saying, I'm going to use you. You're going to be my instrument. To deliver my people but God I'm, I'm, I'm slow of speech I stutter I, I, I'm not a person that you would use besides that I'm a wanted man the, 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 the Pharaoh wants to kill me well, you know choose somebody of a, a better qualified person and and God said you know who gives man his sight and who makes him blind who gives man his speech and makes him deaf is it not I the Lord your God it's not about us. It's never about us. It's always about him. I think of Gideon. Gideon. Threshing in secret. God calls him and says, I'm gonna you're my instrument to deliver my children, to deliver my people. And Gideon, well, God, you know, all right, I, I, I believe it's you, but I'm not sure. So I'm gonna put this cloth on the ground and in the morning. If the cloth is wet but the ground is dry, I'll believe it's you. Well, that's a strange coincidence. So then he goes and he says, well, not, not to put you to the test, God, but I need to be sure it's you. So, so if, if the ground is wet and the cloth is dry, and so he does that. So then he gathers the people of Israel and he says, okay, we're going to get, get an army together. And 30-some and thousand people show up and God says, no, that's too many send some of them home. So he says, hey, look, if any of you are scared, go home. All but about 3,000 left. God says, eh, too many. Give them a test. And so he tests them. He, he watches them as they drink the water from the brook. And those that bend and put their face in the water and drink, he sends home. He ends up with 300 men. 300. Why? Because it wasn't about Israel having a great army and bringing deliverance by their own hand. It was about God stretching forth his hand and showing them 
who he was. God always calls us to faith before he moves. Always he calls us to faith before he moves. Thank you, Ruth, for challenging us and sharing with us. Um, I have an announcement to make, so I'm going to ask uh, Brandon and Grace to come up here for just a sec. I would like to introduce you to Mr. and Mrs. Brandon Hurd. They were married yesterday, so congratulations. We bless God for their union. Um, if you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 25. We have been working through um, a series on money. And only one part of this series had to deal with giving. I think it was a critical part. But unfortunately, in the church, we tend not to talk about money except from the angle of give. And yet God, in His wisdom, has given us hundreds of verses dealing with the topic of money. He's given us an excess of 200 verses that are instructional about how to deal with money. So we've talked about whose money is it? It's God's money. It's all His. All of it. What you have is what He has given you. Okay? We talked about how you earn it matters. That we should be workers of integrity. We've talked about how you spend it matters. We've talked about the giving, the tithing, the offerings, the alms. <coughs> And we're working through what you do with what you have. And, and last week we were in Luke chapter 19. We talked about the parable of the, the ten servants and the ten minors. And, and I, I wanted to really stress to you that Jesus is a demanding Lord. That He has requirements that He expects us to meet. And we talked about the ten minors, the ten servants. One of them came back and, and showed his prophet. And, and another came back and showed his prophet. And one came back and said, well, Lord, I know you're, you're a, a severe man. And we looked up the word severe. In the Greek, it's austeros, which is where we get the word austere. And, and what does that mean? Well, it, it means harsh. It means severe. It means without compromise. This is the line. You don't cross this line. And we understood that in that parable, the nobleman was Jesus. And the nobleman was going off to receive a kingdom. And, and the people chased after him and said, we don't want you to be our king. But the servants were given a task. And we understand now. Well, somebody brought to my attention afterward. And I want to explain something. There are two things that, one, I misspoke last week. Um, a minor was not one month's salary. It was three months' salary. So for those of you that were doing the math and check, not a single one of you caught my error. <laughs> Boo! If you did catch my error, you should have come and talked to me. Boo! Okay, it's three months salary. That's why it was eleven thousand ish dollars in today, take today's economy in Montana. Okay, so we, we talked about the fact that he entrusted each of his servants, and the servants were those he had called. And somebody said, well, he was talking to the Jews. So wouldn't the, the servants be the Jews? And, and yes, initially. But remember that the Lord is going to come back as king, right? And we talked about those two peaks that set in alignment so they look as one. And how the Jews were looking, it tells us before this parable, before Jesus tells this parable, they're expecting him to go to Jerusalem and declare himself king of Israel. They're looking at the peaks, and they don't realize that there's two separate peaks, and they're separated by a great valley. And they're looking at the peak that sees him coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah, as the reigning king. And yet he's here as the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. 
He's here as an atoning sacrifice. And so while initially, yeah, he was speaking to the Jews, because that's the people that were around him, he's referring to his coming back, and between those two mountain peaks, guess where we are? We're in that period of grace. And so, by extension, this has to apply to us. Right? We're the servants. And he expects an accounting. There is going to be an accounting for what we have done with what he has given us. Now, what has he given us? Everything. Everything. Now, he's speaking right here. He's speaking about money. Okay? And, and I don't want to, you know, blow anybody out of the water by saying, oh, it's just about money. It's all about money. Show me the money. That's not, what it's, that's not what's going on here. Okay? There is a depth to this. It's a parable. It's a teaching point. You know, when Jesus talks about the fishermen, he is not excluding those of us that do not fish. When he's talking about the farmer, he is not excluding those of us that do not farm. It's a teaching point. And yet, so many times I've heard sermons that talk about everything else that he gives us, the talents, the abilities, the opportunities, the salvation, those things that he gives us, and yet they completely disregard the money. Money's a huge issue, folks. That's the one thing that Jesus lays out before us as a direct competition to God. Because a man cannot serve two masters. He will either love the one and despise the other, or he will love the one and hate the other. And then he immediately follows that up with, you cannot serve both God and money. Okay? So we can't eliminate money from this equation. Yeah, it's bigger than that. It's much bigger than that. But don't disqualify money because it's bigger than that. Okay? So Matthew 25. <clears throat> We're going to pick up in verse 14. So Matthew 25, starting in verse 14. Jesus is speaking. Now, let's give you a little bit of background. Jesus is gone up to the temple. He's in Jerusalem. And as they're walking around the temple, Jesus was teaching. And, and, and the disciples, they're looking. They're like, whoa, look at this temple. Isn't it incredible? Look at the size of these stones. Look at the artwork. Look at all that man has done to make this beautiful place. And then Jesus foretells the destruction of the temple. Okay, so we know Jesus is in Jerusalem. We know he's been up at the temple. And now he's going about and he's telling these parables. Okay, so this is the last week of his life before the cross. So he's sharing, verse 14, he says, he's speaking of the kingdom of God. If you back up to, to verse 1, he says, the kingdom of heaven will be light. Okay? And then in verse 14, he says, for it will be, what is it? It's the kingdom of heaven. Okay? For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He had received the five talents, went at once, and traded with them, so that he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master! You delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, 
I know you are a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to him who had the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. <coughs> and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. <coughs> and that place... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I think God wants to get your attention. <coughs> Thank you for the courtesy call. <laughs> <coughs> and cast the worthless servant out into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <coughs> the only time I cough like this is here at church. <coughs> One thing I want to clarify before we move into explaining this parable. Uh, a number of people have commented that uh, <clears throat> obviously the Bible is not inerrant because... <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Luke tells this story with ten servants and ten minos. And, and Matthew tells the same story with only three servants and, and three talents. So somebody got it wrong. Luke in his research got it wrong, or, or Matthew in his recall got it wrong. I laugh. Because who says it's the same story? We know the ten minas was told in Jericho because it comes right on the heels of his visiting with Zacchaeus. We know that the three talents is happening in Jerusalem because they were walking through the temple when this whole series started. So not only is there a separation of space, there's a separation of time. Now, <clears throat> in the story of the ten minas, the, the servant who hid the master's money, his, his, what he had was taken away from him and given to the one who had ten. Okay? And yet it was the citizens who did not want Jesus to rule over him who were cast out, who were destroyed before him. In this story, we only have three servants, and it is the last servant who hid his master's money who is cast out. Okay? And I believe it is because of the audience, the targeted audience that Jesus was speaking to. I believe in Jericho, Jesus is speaking directly to those people that were gathered around him, the disciples and others who were there to hear what he had to teach. I believe in Jerusalem in the temple, even though the disciples were there and there were people that wanted to hear, I think he's speaking to the Pharisees. I think he's speaking to the religious leaders who had received from God the law and the prophets and knew, should have known, who Jesus was and why he was there, and yet were looking for a way to kill him. This is why I think there's a change between the two stories. Okay? Jesus told one message here to Jericho, to an audience that, that needed to hear what was being said. 
And he's telling another message here to a different audience with a different target, with a different purpose. Very similar in, in their story, but to different people, therefore a different emphasis. Okay? So, <clears throat> when somebody says, oh yeah, you know, the Bible's not inerrant, look at this. You can say, well, yeah, you're wrong. And say it with confidence. Now, we talked last week about a mina. A mina was approximately three months' wages. Okay? In Montana, in uh, 2015, the average wage in Montana was $44,222. I don't know where they got that number. That's the state of Montana that said that. Okay? So, three months' wages would be about $11,000. Okay? But a talent is an entirely different thing. Okay? A talent is about the equivalent of 20 years wages. Okay? 20 years wages. And so, if we take the average in Montana, and we multiply that by 20, each talent is going to have a current worth of about $884,000 $884,400. $884,400. And he's like, here. Or rather, more like, here. Okay? And yet, we see that he doesn't give the same amount to each, does he? Because, see, let's, let's look down here in verse 15. He says, to one he gave five talents. Do you want to know what that number comes up to? Do you care? Yes. $4,422,200. To another two talents, $1,768,800. And to the third, one talent, $884,400. Okay? But, but look what it says at the end. Well, why did he give difference? He must have favored this, this one over that one. No. He said, he gave it to each according to his ability. Does that mean that the one received the one talent was no good? No, it means he had different gifts. It means that he had different abilities. Okay? Does that mean that, that two was not favored as five was? No. He had different abilities. He had different skills. Okay? So, each is given according to his ability. <clears throat> then, look what it says immediately after. It said, he who had received... Oh, I'm sorry. Then he went away. He left. Now, Jesus Community Church is, is what you would call my employer. God is my boss. So that would be akin to one of you guys coming to my house, we'll say it's Dennis, and he lumps on my dining room table, how much money did I say it was? No, 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 five talents. $4,422,200. Dennis, Jeannie, you're going to have to help him carry it. <laughs> and he says, here. According to your ability. I don't know. Dennis might think according to my ability it's 844000 <laughs> He dumps it on my table and then, so I'm going on a trip. I'll see you later. And he leaves. And I look at that money on my table and I think, now what do I do? I know what Christy's thinking. Taco Bell for You guys got to be louder in your house. <laughs> so then the master went away. But then look what happened here. Okay? He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them. Now, traded with them, that, that, that doesn't mean he was like, here, I'll, I'll give you two silvers for your two silvers. No, it means he did business. He invested. He went out and he made that money work. Okay? 
Now, you notice that it doesn't say that he made five and never lost any. We don't know how long the master was gone. We know it was a long time, but we don't know. I mean, is a long time a couple weeks? Is it a couple months? Is it a couple years? Is it a couple decades? We don't know. We just know it was a long time. So he went at once, and the end result of all of his business is that he turned a profit of five talents more. Okay? So when his master is coming back, he's going to render back to his master just under nine million dollars. Okay? He worked. He traded. He did business. He conducted his master's business with integrity. Okay? Now you notice that of that amount of money, at no point did any of it, did he ever claim any of it as his. It was his master's money. He didn't go, okay, master, you you gave me five, and, and here's yours, there's your five, and then we split it even. Because it was my work. No, because he understands it's all the masters. Okay? So he goes away immediately and conducts business. Now the second man, he also went and made two talents more. He engaged in business. He was about his master's business. And he made two more. He doubled what he was given. But the one who was given one, you, you got to wonder, if it was given according to his ability, why did he get anything? Because he had the ability. He had the ability to do something with that. But he chose not to. He chose to take that and hide it. And not engage in business. Not be about his master's business. He kept his hands off. Verse 19. <coughs> Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. See, it, it says a long time, but it doesn't tell us how long. And right here is a predicament that we often find ourselves in as Christians. Because Jesus said, I am coming back. He even said, I'm coming back soon. But soon is relative, isn't it? How does a, a, a God who lives outside of time consider a moment as a thousand years? To God, it's a moment. He exists outside of time. And, and his delay in coming is not because he forgot his watch. It's not because he forgot to set the clock. His delay in coming is because of his mercy and his grace that all might be saved. Okay? It's not for his benefit that he's waiting to come. It's for our benefit. Okay, And the dilemma is that a long period of time from that moment of salvation until you stand before him, there's a long period of time. I came to the Lord when I was six years old. I'm absolutely convinced at six years old in my childlike faith when my mom presented us with the gospel that I made a decision then and there that I was God's. Okay? So this year, that puts me at about 41 years as a Christian. That's a long time. Some of you have been Christians even longer. And I, I want to encourage you today. It may seem like a long time and it may feel like you're at the end of your rope and you're just hanging on. Or you get to the end and you're wondering, why am I still here? What's going on? The reason you're still here is because God has a purpose and a plan for you. Remember, He's not delaying for His benefit. He's delaying for yours. Because there is something left for you to do. To be busy about His business. Okay? So, don't grow weary in the long haul. 
We run this race with endurance to win the prize. We don't know how long the race is when we start, but we set our eyes on the finish and we keep pressing on until that time when we cross the finish line right into our Savior's arms. Okay? So he's gone a long time, but then he comes back. But then he comes back. And look what it says. He came and settled accounts with him. The first thing he does on coming back is saying, all right, let's settle our accounts so we can get on with things. So verse 20. Now, it, it's interesting the way this is translated because I want to point something out here. He who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. The, the way this is rendered in the Greek is a little bit different than the way we understand it. Because in the Greek, the way that this is parsed, it's more like he's saying, Master, you have given me five talents. Look! Look! He's excited. He's exuberant. He is thrilled to be able to settle accounts with the Master. He's like, look, I have made five more. It's not like, well, here's the five he gave me and here's another five. Now what? He's pumped. He's excited. This is the kind of attitude I want to have when I stand before God and I have to settle accounts with Him. I want to be able to show Him, look, this is what I bring. This is what I did with everything that you gave me. I want to be excited because I know what He's going to say if I do so. He's going to say, well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Now, do I stumble? Do you stumble? Yeah, we all stumble. James says that we all stumble in many ways. Okay? But Proverbs says a wise man falls seven times. What does he do? He gets up. He gets up. That's the whole point of God's Spirit being here, to help us get back up to our feet. I've heard it said that when you fall in your Christian walk, you always fall forward. Because when you get up, you realize and you've moved forward. Okay? Now you may trip over that same issue time and time and time again. We all have certain areas in our lives that we struggle with. Mine are different than hers. Hers are different than his. His are different than yours. But we all have areas of weakness that we stumble in. And it's through that process of His Spirit bringing us back to our feet, pressing on, helping us, teaching us, to enabling us to overcome, that's the whole process of sanctification. Okay? So, his master said, well done, good and faithful servant. But he doesn't stop there because something else happens. He rewards him. He says, you have been faithful over a little. How much money did he give him? $4.4 million? Yeah, I, you know, I gave you some pocket change. I, I gave you a little. I will set you over much. He who has been faithful with a little will be faithful with much. If you feel like, man, how come I'm the dude with one talent? Because if you are faithful with that one talent, he can entrust to you much more. This is not a comparative issue. It's not about me versus you. It's about me and God. And you and God. And what are you going to do with the things that He has given you? And He said, uh, He also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two more. That's the same idea. Look, I'm bringing you two more. And look, is the master disappointed because he only brought two? Much well, you know, I really thought he had more ability than that. I was, I was kind of hoping he'd bring five. So, nice try, kid. That, that's not what he did, is it? No, because he says the exact same thing 
to this one. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. See, both of them didn't just get put over much. They received a bonus. They get to enter into the master's joy. What does that look like? I don't know, but I can't wait to find out. I'm not what you would call a joyful person. I'm not somebody that exudes joy. As a matter of fact, when I'm around joyful people, I tend to go, ooh, could you restrain some of the joy? <laughs> that stuff is catchy. <laughs> I have never in my life been considered a joyful person. That's why God gave me Christy. She's trying to teach me about those things. I had a doctor's appointment not too long ago. And the doctor asked me, what did I do for fun? <laughs> what does he mean? I don't do anything for fun. Fun is not even on my radar. I've never been a person that's about, I'm going to go have fun. I just take fun as it comes. And, and he, he, well, he was concerned. Well, you know, there's something not right in your life. And, well, then it hasn't been right my whole life. Now, that's not to say I don't have fun. But it's not something that I pursue. It's something that just happens. I think sometimes God says, all right, you know what? Enough, Mr. Sirius. And, and that's why I have five children. Because my kids are kooks. If you've ever been around the five of them together, it's, it's, a, it's a riot. It's a blast. It's hysterical. Half the time, you know, Benjamin, how many years of your life did you spend trying to make me laugh? Oh, quite a while. Quite a lot. And I remember, he did succeed. He did succeed. Uh, and it was, uh, he was sitting at the table and he was, I don't even remember what it was. He was doing something and I started to grin. And he was like, there, I did it! <laughs> well, if that's going to be your response, you can have it. <laughs> okay? But I want to see what the master's joy is all about. I, I want to enter into his joy so that I can see what this thing is. And I, I want to press on to take hold of that. Then there's the last servant. We've been given one talent. Now you notice it doesn't say which one re received based on, you know, did the five receive because he had the most abilities? Or did he receive the five because he had the least abilities? And so he needed a bigger opportunity to show improvement. You know, it doesn't say that. The, the inference is probably that's the way, but it doesn't say that. But this one that received one, <clears throat> he's afraid of his master. Okay? Now, this is something that, that you need to take as a warning, folks. There is a righteous fear of God. Hebrews says it is a fearful thing, fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. But Scripture also tells us that perfect love casts out fear. And, and when you come to that place in your walk with God, where there you receive His perfect love, there is no fear. Because you're not under His judgment anymore. You're under His grace. Now, He is a fearful God. He's fearsome because those that oppose Him are going to see His wrath. But we are not partakers. We're not inheritors of His wrath, are we? Okay. So, He was afraid of His Master, which indicates to me that He did not know His Master he didn't know his master's heart. Now it says, you know, you, you, you gather where you didn't scatter. And, and what does that mean? I, I think it means, just like I said last week, he's an employer. He has people that do those things for him. He has people that sow his fields. He has people that, that harvest his fields. He's the master. That's not his job. His job is to put people in charge of that. 
and those people take care of that. Okay? But this guy is afraid of his master. And so he says, well, Master, I know you are a hard man. You reap where you did not sow, and you gather where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. Okay? But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. See, the, the servant's sin was not an act of commission. He didn't go out and kill someone. He didn't go squander his master's money. It was a sin of omission. It was that he failed to do what was right. It wasn't that he engaged in sin, that he was evil in what he did. He was evil in what he did not do. And see, this is the purpose of this whole message. Because see, if God has gifted you, and I'm going to tell you right now, God has gifted you. Okay? He expects you to invest in what He has given you. Now, each of us are gifted in different ways. Okay? Each of us have different gifts, different talents, different abilities. But every one of us shares, if you are a believer, every one of us shares one gift in common, and that's salvation. Okay? And that gift has got to be built on. It has to be invested in. It's got to be shared. It's got to be done business with. Okay? Such that the natural outcome of investing in the master's business is the fulfillment of the Great Commission. See what I'm saying? We've all received that thing in common. And so that should be the natural outflow of this. Engaging in the master's business should be about sharing his salvation. Uh, I love Dennis. I'm going to put you on the spot, okay? It's a big spot. Okay. <laughs> I, I love listening to Dennis' stories about how he goes about his life because wherever he is, Dom Florian is just like this. Somehow or another, he works God into the conversation. And sometimes it's just by being Dennis and just going, you know, I serve a great God. Who do you serve? Or just working, just kind of blunt and in your face. And that's sometimes what's needed. Um, we were talking after brothers meeting, and Mike Roach uh, was talking uh, about Dominic and, and how... You know, they went out hunting together. <clears throat> and when you go out hunting, the object is not to run into people. It's, it's to get your animal. And how they had agreed they were going to meet at a particular place. And, and when Mike comes up to this place, here's Dom with another hunter sharing the gospel. <laughs> no elk, no deer, no bear, whatever it is they're hunting, but possibly a new convert, a new disciple. So I think Dominic, in eternity, received a greater received a greater reward because of that day. Okay. Now some of us, we're slow builders. We build relationship. We we work with those that are in our circle, which is really that scriptural. It says we we work in Jerusalem first, that area that is immediately around us, and then Judea, and then Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. Okay. But we've got to start here. All right, next week I'm wrapping this section up. My goal is still by the end of October we're going to wrap up money. Okay? There's a couple things I want you to take away from today. One, God is a demanding boss. Jesus is demanding. He is austere. He is without compromise. Two, He expects a return on His investment in you. You will give an account at some point, every one of us. We will stand before him and he's going to want to know, what did you do with what I gave you? Simply put in the illustration in the parable, 
What'd you do with all the money I gave you? But beyond that, the depth, the scope beyond that, it's not just money. It's about what you did with your life. All of those blessings that he poured into you. What did you do with the gift of salvation? Did you bury it so that on that day you could give it back to the master? Or did you invest and do business with it? Father, we bless you today. Because, Father, even when we fail, you lift us back to our feet. You encourage us. You love us. You strengthen us. And you show us how to do it right. Father, I thank you that you have understood in your infinite wisdom the difficulties we would face with money and the struggle that we would have, whether having too little or having too much, that it would be a struggle for us and that you have given us your word certain things to guard against, certain things to prepare us to how to properly handle money. I thank you, Father, that you have gifted this church in such an incredible and varied way. And I ask, Father, that we would be faithful. We would be faithful in engaging in the business of the kingdom. We bless you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.